This is Join Us in France, episode 265. Bonjour and Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France comes to you with the support of wonderful patrons. If this is your first time joining us, welcome to you, and let me explain that on Join Us in France, you'll hear four types of episodes. Number one, trip reports, where I chat with somebody about how their trip went. Number two, episodes with Elise, who is a great friend and a licensed tour guide in France. Number three, solo shows with me, where I answer questions that come up a lot about visiting France in general and where I bring in my French native uh, perspective. Number four, short episodes where I answer something that keeps coming up on the show's Facebook group and I try to do it under five minutes. Oh, and I normally don't sound like that, but I can explain. <laughs> I was savagely attacked by a cold virus that my own brother brought into his country home on Christmas Day. Alas, you can't even trust family anymore. <laughs> Believe it or not, I sounded worse yesterday. So today's episode is a trip report with Michelle Donnell. And you have a second last name, Michelle, but I'm not even going to try to say it. I... But I'll write it on the show notes. <laughs> she took a trip to Paris uh, in late August 2019 with her husband and two preschool children. You may have wondered if taking your four and a half year old and your two and a half year old to Paris is a good idea. Because, you know, we're all a bit judgy. But before you jump to conclusions, let's hear how it went for Michelle and her family. And since I lived in the U.S., when my only daughter was born, I made the long trip home to France to visit my family on many occasions. And traveling with young kids is not something most people look forward to. But it can be done with class and panache, as you will hear from Michelle. In this episode, she talks about why they decided to take their two children, how they prepared them for the trip. She brings up the everlasting stroller dilemma. She warns about some mistakes they made and not something I had to deal with. The very real challenges of traveling while your child is going through potty training. And she lived to tell the tale. And because they love food almost as much as I do, but not quite, Michelle gives us some great restaurant recommendations and lists their favorite activities in Paris. You'll see it's a great trip report. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 265, the number 265. And if you're planning a trip to France, this site is chock full of great resources. You should check it out. Bonjour, Michel, and welcome to join us in France. Bonjour, Annie. How nice to talk to you. Bienvenue to you. Today, we are going to talk about having a trip to France. Mostly, we'll talk about Paris, but other places as well, with your preschool children. So, that's, that's something that uh, would intimidate many of us. <laughs> Trust me, it intimidated us too. Yes, yes. So let's see how you pulled it off and what uh, recommendations you have for other people who are considering doing something like this. First of all, please Great. introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your family. My name is Michelle Echemian. Um We live in Atlanta and um, we traveled to France in late August and early September with um, – my husband, and then our two children who were four and a half and two and a half at that time. Right. And that's 2019. Correct. Right. Because people might listen to this in five years. <laughs> so I just want to make sure it's clear. Okay. And, and, uh, and why did you, I mean, how did you plan your trip and why did you decide on France? We decided on France, um, interestingly enough, because last year around Christmas time, uh, my daughter at her preschool had a secret Santa exchange. Do you have those in France? 
Not really, but I've had them in the U.S., so I know what you mean. Okay, great. So what it is is when you choose a name out of a hat and then you give that person a gift and they have to guess who gave it to them. And what my daughter got was a snow globe of Paris and the Eiffel Tower. Ah. Yeah, and so she started asking a lot about what's this building, where is this location, and so she wanted to learn about France. And so we had an atlas at home read to her about France and thought, well, maybe we should go to Paris sometime soon, maybe in a few years. And we're very fortunate that there are a lot of great deals out of Atlanta to Paris, to Charles de Gaulle. Mm -hmm. So we cashed in some Delta miles and flew to Paris and got a really great redemption. Yeah, that makes it easier, doesn't it, when you live in a hub? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. All right. And I hear you, you, you've you been listening to the podcast for a while. Yeah, right after we booked our tickets in March of 2019, I started doing some research online. I looked um, through Apple Podcasts. And of course, Rick Steves was the first one that came up. Sure. But if you keep scrolling down a little bit, um, I saw Join Us in France, and I listened to an episode with you and Elise, and we were hooked after that. So the <laughs> podcast has been really helpful in planning our trip. Oh, thank you. That's great. Okay. So where did you go? We started out in Paris. We spent about three days there. And then we went down to Bordeaux for three days, and we actually chose Bordeaux because of advice from your Facebook group. We were Mm -hmm. debating between Bordeaux and Burgundy, and Bordeaux went out. And then we went to the Gers for four days. We wanted to have kind of a French countryside experience. Oh, yes. So after, yeah, and it was, it was very rural and rustic and, and wonderful. So then we went back to Paris for a day and then flew back. I think with kids, it's a good idea to have some time in the countryside. So I, I would second that recommendation. I'm still there. I just don't, I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Keep oh, going. Well, I, It was great. And we really wanted to make sure having small kids on the trip that we gave them a lot of time to run outside and to explore. And that really went into the planning of the trip. And we got that everywhere, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's cool. Okay. So uh, why you said you hesitated taking the kids. Why did you decide, decide to take them in the end? There were a couple of reasons. I think first and foremost, we wanted them to get some wonderful travel experiences as children. My husband and I didn't really get to travel much as kids, and so we wanted something different for our kids. Also, um, we live far away from family. We just moved to Atlanta a few years ago, and it would have been hard for either set of grandparents to come to Atlanta and care for the kids. Mm. And if if we wanted to fly them to California or Minnesota, where the grandparents are, it would have been too much hassle. We probably would have been spending more money and more time doing that. So we just decided, you know what, let's take them and and see what happens. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's very good. We also um, spent a lot of time preparing our kids for the trip. We knew that in order for them to get a lot out of it, that that would be important. And so we um, did a lot of research on language apps. We prepared them with art and music and told them, a few different things about that. Do you want me to go into that? A yes, bit? yes. I, I, I was surprised how much you did with the language, actually, because most people don't do that much. But yeah, I want to hear about that. First of all, we looked at a few different language apps. We looked at Dino or Dino Lingo, and we looked at Muzzy BBC. And um, with Dino Lingo, it was a little expensive, about $17 a month. But that one I thought was geared the most towards kids my children's age because it had a lot of random um, cartoons and animations and then it had these really great games that the kids could play and the Mm. kids really loved that and that solidified their learning of for example colors so Mm -hmm. I would recommend Dino Lingo for kids that are my children's age right so under Um, five under five yes I would say for kids over five Muzzy BBC would be a good one Mm. Um, that one is $29 for three months It has a very consistent storyline of a king and a queen and a princess who falls in love with her gardener. And then there's the evil wizard who loves the princess. And so it was really cute and it was very seamless. But I would say that the games in that one were geared more towards older children. So my children didn't really like that. I see. I see. Okay. Hmm, Very interesting. And I mean, how much French did your kids actually use in France? 
some. We really made a point of learning a few key phrases. Um, my daughter learned to say, je m'appelle Ashley. Yes. Je suis, um, je suis Caton. Uh-huh. Um, hope, hopefully that's all making sense. And, um, <laughs> well, j'ai Caton, je, actually, but. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, that's yeah. what she said. So I screwed <laughs> yes. that up. J'ai, yeah. j'ai Caton yeah. and je suis une fille. Yes. So, so she said that my son could say bonjour and that was about it. But, right. Um, right. It worked out and people understood them and seemed very charmed by that. So yeah. I, I think as, so long as they know how to say bonjour and, and understand when people are asking for their names, French people love kids usually. I mean, I don't, you'll tell me if that's what you experience, but in generally speaking, French people love to see little kids. Yeah, and people were incredibly friendly to us and to our children. We didn't have any problems with that. I think, too, it helped that we prepared the kids for French culture. Mm -hmm. My husband taught them a lot about Rodin and the thinking man. Mm. And so before the trip, they would make the pose and try to guess what the thinking man was thinking. For instance, my daughter would say, hmm, what's that smell? Or... (laughs) I think I'm going to have ice cream for dessert. So she was trying to guess what the thinking man was thinking, which was really cute. (laughs) That's adorable. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Another great book was um, Paris Hide and Seek. um, That was recommended to us through the Facebook page. And it's uh, 24 different pages. And you have to find this little boy and this dog and this balloon all throughout the different Paris landscapes. And so, Every night before we went to bed, the kids got to do a few pages and they remembered seeing those things when we were in Paris. Oh, we remember seeing that in our book. So that worked out really well. Yeah, that's great. So just putting the prep in in advance, I think, made the trip more meaningful for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll put the links to the books. There's another one that you talk about, Mission Paris. Yes. And so that one, depending on your Amazon membership, if you have one, can be free. Um, And that taught us, for instance, when we were driving to the Louvre, we read about the Mona Lisa and it talked all about the theft of the Mona Lisa. And so my daughter was really curious about that. And it taught us to look for the Fleur de Lis and the Castle Prince at Saint-Chapelle because those are the family symbols of the family that built that, I think, right? Yes. So... Yes. So, yeah, so yeah the fleur de, lis, fleur de lis is the, uh, it's the symbol of French royalty. And so they saw that, and that was very cool for them. So yeah. I would definitely recommend those books. Excellent. And then one that you liked is Bringing Up Bibi, which I've heard of, but I haven't read it. Yeah, and I didn't get to read it all before the trip, but I've finished it since I got home. And it's written by an American mother who's raising kids in Paris with her British husband. And what she does is she researches how French parenting differs from American parenting. And she noticed that French children were much more well-behaved than her own child. And so she wanted to know why. And um, I think some of the key takeaways were that French parents are much more reserved before giving in to their children. So they don't just give in immediately like most American parents do. Um, And she said that French children aren't praised for every single little thing that they do like American children. So um, I thought it was a great book. I wished I'd read it before my own kids were born, but... (laughs) But it is what it is. So I'm recommending it to all my friends who are new moms. Yeah, this is funny because I had this conversation with my friend Patricia. I stay with her when I go to Paris. And and I, I said, oh, yeah, French kids, you know, we're lucky. They're usually well behaved. And then the next day I took the train and it was a mom with three children. And one of them was demon from, you know, that <laughs> one. And they were, it was definitely a French family. And I thought, oh, this is what I get for saying that French kids are well behaved. I get stuck on a train for four and a half hours with this child. <laughs> So it can, I mean, you can have difficult children in any country, you know, be assured. But, but yeah, generally speaking, French people, it's, it's like if they tell their kids, you know, you have to talk to me in a civilized manner before I give you what you want, they're going to stick to it. Like, you know, they're not going to put up with whining and screaming and stuff like that, typically. Yeah, it said that, um, you know, Americans tend to let their lives revolve around their children, and that's not necessarily the case in, in France. So I thought it was oh. a lot of really good tips. Yeah, interesting. 
We also prepared the kids with music. So my husband downloaded a lot of French music. I think he referenced your Spotify list that you had created. Yes. And so that was really good. And I think the kids in particular liked Mika and Benabar. Yes. Do those names ring a bell? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, and it's funny because... <laughs> <laughs> one of the songs that you say they liked um, by Mika is kind of a it talks about sex <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, they, and they wouldn't have known that so it's okay but, uh, <laughs> but I was like oh okay <laughs> alright well they're none the wiser so. that's right it doesn't we'll, really matter we'll they don't know listening. <laughs> that's right they don't and know then, yeah and for the adults um, my husband and I really liked Zaz and Stromae a lot yes so, yeah. yeah great music great French music cool yeah, I don't remember uh, the name yeah. of the of the playlist I made public on Spotify. I know there's one, but I can't I can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The other thing that we really wanted to talk to the kids about was pickpockets, just because we knew that if we encountered people who we suspected were pickpockets, we were probably going to be pretty rude and gruff with them. Yeah. And that's not normally how we are around normal people. And so we we told the kids, you know, there might be some strangers that come up to us and try to start talking to us. And if we say no and we run away from them or walk away from them, you have to follow us. And that actually did come in handy because we did encounter a few pickpockets when we were by the Eiffel Tower. But mm-hmm. thanks to your podcast and to your Facebook group, we knew exactly how to respond. Right. And we just said N- no and made sure they walked away or we walked away from them. And so the kids understood what was going on and that went really well. That's good. Yeah. It saves a lot of hassle. If you don't engage with these people, if you can recognize what's happening and you don't engage, it's much, much better. Yeah. Um, the other thing we did too, was there was one of your podcasts where you interviewed a mom who was a photographer yes. and she, and she talked about getting a camera for her kids. And I believe that her kids were much older than my kids were, but I thought that there was a lot of value in that. And so we researched cameras, and I know you're a photographer too. Yeah. And we picked, so you tell me if this was a good pick or not. We picked the Fujifilm Instax 90. You know, I have never used that camera, but usually Fujifilm is a good camera. So I would, my guess would be probably very good, but I've never used it. Good. And we liked it. It was cheap. It was only $50 and it was an instant camera. So that was more satisfying for the kids. So, so, it, my, so it, pu- it puts out a photo, a printed photo right away? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Nice. And uh, yeah, it was really cool. And my daughter definitely took pictures of things, whereas my son just took random pictures, but they ended up being very artsy. So in the end, it was pretty cool. <laughs> well, he's little. He was two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> He did well. We're proud of him. That's good. (laughs) The other big question that we really spent a lot of time considering, and I'm sure others who travel with kids this age do too, is whether or not we should bring a stroller. Ah. And yeah, so that was a big one. And our daughter hadn't been using a stroller for a while. With our son, we'd been using a stroller somewhat, though he'd mostly outgrown it. So what we decided in the end was not to bring a stroller because we thought if we brought one, it was just one extra thing to carry and the kids might fight over it. Yeah. Um, So we didn't bring it, but we did identify a company that we could call in Paris if we wanted to rent a stroller. Okay. Um, Ah, okay. Yeah. I don't. Oh yeah. You put the link in there. Uh, You put the link in there. What's it called? The babyterms.com. Yeah, I'll put yeah, I'll put it in the show notes so people can find it. But yeah, that's that's oh. good that you can rent a stroller because strollers are not cheap in France. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, some people say, you know, I want to buy a cheapo umbrella stroller like I'd get at Walmart for 30 bucks or whatever. You're not going to find that. I, I've oh. never seen one, you know, so oh, wow. so it, it, it'd be a couple hundred is what you'd find. Wow. Well, we're glad that we didn't need one because we could have either called the company or we were thinking we could just go to Monoprix and get one. But it sounds like that's not the case. You can, but it's not cheap. Mm. They do sell them at Monoprix. I mean, mind you, I haven't been shopping for strollers in a very long time. But <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I doubt you'd find it that cheap. Okay. Well, we didn't need one. We're very happy that we didn't bring one. Others might want to bring them, but for us, not having a stroller was the best decision. So are your kids good walkers, or did you carry them a lot? 
Uh, a little of both. Okay. Uh, especially with my son. But yeah, they were pretty good walkers. They really amazed us. Yes. Let's talk about your actual trip to, to Paris and what you did day to day a little bit. Okay. We got in on a Tuesday morning and we arrived really early. And so our Airbnb that we had got in Les Marais wasn't ready yet. Right. So what we did was we used a company called Nanny Bag and basically dropped off our bags at a souvenir shop until um, the early afternoon. Oh, that's cool. And nanny Bag, huh? Hmm. Nanny Bag. And it had really good reviews and we had a really good experience with them. So if you're in a typical American situation where you're flying in and getting in really early in the morning, but you can't check in yet, I would recommend Nanny Bag. Right. And they probably have uh, contacts in a lot of places all around Paris. All around Paris and all around the world, actually. Really? Cool. Mm -hmm. Very good to know. Yeah, we liked them, and we thought we were really smart because we picked a location that was right across the street from the Pompidou Center, and we thought we'd take the kids there for the morning, but we learned that it's closed on Tuesday mornings. So <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> yes. But you live and you learn. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> What we ended up doing that first day, we went to Ile de la Cité, mm -hmm. and we walked across the street from Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and even though you can't get very close, the kids loved it, and they were so excited because, as I mentioned earlier, they, rec they recognized it from their book, and they had heard all about it. They'd seen The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and so... Uh, we yeah. didn't feel like we were missing out on anything, even though we couldn't get near it. Yeah, you can't. I mean, it's getting better. You can get a little closer now, but yeah, it. Yeah, there's construction going on, so that limits your movements around the cathedral. Yeah, it definitely did. So um, after that, we went to Saint Chapelle, and yeah. we were really lucky on our trip. I would recommend going at the time of year that we went because we hardly encountered any lines anywhere. That's cool. Um, Yeah, we were able to walk right into Saint Chapelle and just spent a few minutes there. And after that, we decided to take a boat trip. So we did Vedette de Pont Neuf. Right, which is pretty um, close to where you were. Yeah, so it was just walking down some stairs, basically. And the kids loved the boat ride. I mean, I think that's a must do for kids that yeah. age. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah really it's fun. That. I mean, could... it's fun for anybody, but for little kids, it's perfect. Oh, it was perfect. And we couldn't hear anything that the narrator was saying, but we didn't care. No, you didn't miss much. <laughs> had a great time. Okay, good. <laughs> I've heard, so I've heard the Vedette du Pont Neuf spiel a few times, and uh, yeah, no, not, not fascinating. <laughs> I mean, pretty much they that... list the names of the... Because in Paris, unlike many other cities, a lot of the very famous monuments are right along the river. And so as you, as you float along the river, you, they name the buildings. And usually they tell you some little silly story and that's it, you know. Cool. So we didn't miss anything and we had a great time. Um, after that, we went to our Airbnb, which was in Les Marais. It was kind of right on the border of where the 3rd, 4th, and 11th arrondissement come together. Right. So so near the Pompidou Center. Uh, okay, then maybe I'm wrong. Um, it was actually really close to... We were about two blocks north of okay. um, Place de Vosges. Ah, okay, okay. And I think it was technically the third. But anyway, we went back there and we knew that we shouldn't fall asleep. But of course, we fell asleep. <laughs> and um, and that's normally the kids nap time anyway. So we figured it wouldn't hurt. And I thought I was so smart because I had planned a late afternoon activity. We were um, going to go to the Atelier Lumière. Did I say that right? Yeah, l'Atelier des Lumières. Yes, yes. Which is very popular. I, I haven't seen it in Paris, but I've seen it in um, uh, Les Beaux de Provence, and it's fabulous. Uh, well, I'd heard wonderful things, and we really wanted to go, but um, I'd booked our tickets for 4 p.m., and we had the kids nap until about 3.30. And my daughter, who's normally the even-keeled child, just threw a hissy fit, and she refused to go anywhere. And yeah. so Eventually, my husband said, why don't you take our son and the two of you can go. And so we tried that. But then our um, Uber canceled on us. And we just thought, you know what? It's not worth it. Now we're late because we 
past the time of our tickets. Oh, and maybe we still could have gone. I probably, don't know. probably. I doubt they they would have refused you, even if you're too late. No. Like if you, I mean, if you're not two days too late, you know, if you're just an hour late or whatever, I'm sure they would have let you in. Okay. Well, anyway, we didn't go, and yeah. we ended up walking around the Place du Vosges, which was great. Um, there, they have a little I playground. Yes, you had talked about the playground, but we didn't find that right away. I think that might be more on the southern end of the playground or southern end of the park. And we came in from the northern side. So oh. kind of on the on the northwestern side, there were some sandboxes. And so the kids were playing in those and they just had a blast. And so we did that for about an hour. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was basically our night. We grabbed some food and went back to the apartment. And again, I would... What I would recommend is not planning out your first day at all because I thought I was so smart to get the tickets and we didn't end up going and it was a waste of money. So with yeah. small kids, just play it by ear that first day. Yes, I think it's the small kids that's the that's the difference here. I think grown ups can, you know, tough it out and go do something if they really want to, but with little kids, it's hard. Yeah, it, it was hard, and we learned our lesson and on the trip and we planned it accordingly based on that first day. Oh, this is interesting. Um, I'm just reading that you, so you got my, you got my audio guide, but you listened to it in advance. Tell, tell us how that worked out. You know, listening to it in advance was a little tricky because it didn't automatically trigger right. the location. So you had to kind of keep clicking through it, but it was really good. And it gave us um, an excellent history of the area and we fully intended to listen to it while we were in Place de Vosges, but because of the kids, it just didn't work yeah, out. But it was a great resource. Right, right. I, I think it's ideal for people who are traveling, especially for solo people, it's perfect. If there's two people, it's very good. The bigger the crowd, the the more hectic it might get. But yeah, you could listen to it before. And if you have a, a good memory, you'll, you'll go, oh, I think I heard about this on the on the audio tour. Yeah. Yeah, like I think we were able to pick out Victor Hugo's house based on the yeah. audio tour, but but <laughs> yeah. we could have been wrong. Who knows? <laughs> All right. So then, they, oh, then you went to Maison Plisson. That's yeah. A... That is a um, grocery store slash I don't know food purveyor that we found on Google. It was two blocks from where we stayed. And we ended up getting our dinners from that place most nights just because it had salami, cheese, wine, fruit. And um, we learned pretty early on on the trip that with small children, you definitely should do your dinners back at the apartment as much as possible. So right. I would definitely recommend them. Right. So so what what you do is you leave in the morning, you stay out as long as you can. And then by the time the kids are really tired, you know, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m., whatever the, t the case might be, you just go home and be inside for the rest of the night. Right. Yeah. And it was more like 3 or 4 p.m. before they got tired at that yeah. age. But yeah, that's exactly what we did. They're very young. I mean, you know, yeah. So don't don't plan too much. Exactly. Don't plan too much. Um, some other things that we did on our next day, we went to the Louvre and we saw the Mona Lisa. We waited in line for about 25 minutes. And I definitely agree with everybody who says it's not worth it. You kind of have to do it just to say you've done it. But um, yeah. otherwise, yeah, it, yeah, I don't ever need to see it again. I read today that uh, 33,000 people go see the Mona Lisa every day. <gasps> wow. So I didn't do the math, but 33,000 people, the Louvre is open for how many hours in the day? I'd have to do the math, but you have to go quick and it's just a madhouse. And that's just average. So that means that in the dead of the winter, maybe there's only 10,000 people that go see Mona Lisa. And in the height of the summer, it's more like 100,000. It's crazy. <sighs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, we, we felt lucky that the line was only 25 minutes, but, um, you know, the Louvre, and this is probably our fault. We probably didn't spend enough time researching it, but it just did not seem child friendly at all. Yeah. Um, we got lost a lot and a lot of the things that we had wanted to see were closed that day. And I would actually not recommend it for people with small children. Yeah, I think for there are better things to do with your time. Yeah, well, preschool children is is probably not ideal. Now, if you have a little bit older children, there's the scavenger hunt that we've talked about that's very good. I can't remember what it's called. Um, it's by Daisy, Daisy the Plume. 
she's been on the podcast. I'll put a link in the show notes. But uh, if if uh, it, also for French speaking kids, they have fabulous uh, workshops for kids in the Louvre. But you have to speak French, you know. So. so- if you're an American kid under the age of five, I would say probably not worth it. Yeah, agreed. What was worth it that we did later that day, we went to Luxembourg Gardens. And I know you have said before, you can't take a trip to Paris without going to Luxembourg Gardens. And I agree 100%. That's it was good. fantastic. We really enjoyed Luxembourg Gardens. And with the kids, is great. Oh, it's great. Now, one thing we didn't know is parts of the park are off limits. And what I mean by that is we actually walked from the Louvre with the kids to Luxembourg Gardens, and mm. um, that's a bit of a hike. I yes, think. there are buses, darling. <laughs> I know, but you know what? We couldn't figure out the bus system, so we well, uh, were City trying to City Mapper. Out. You install City Mapper, and from wherever you are, you go to a bus stop, and you say, take me to this one. I can't remember the number of the bus, but there is a bus between the Louvre and the Luxembourg Garden. I've taken it. <laughs> so yeah, we, we knew. Anyone. We saw yeah. that, but yeah. what we couldn't figure out, and again, we just forgot because you've mentioned it many times on your podcast, was how to pay if you don't have change. And so that's what we were oh, worried about. Yeah. So anyway, it was it's, a nice It's walk. always worth, if, you, if you're going to Paris, it's always worth buying a... Uh, some metro tickets now. Oh, now they're going to change it all, so it's not going to be metro tickets anymore. It's going to be something called um, Navigo Easy, and I think the card itself is like a euro or two per person. And then, or um, I'm not sure if you can use it the same card for several people. In Toulouse, you can. In Toulouse, you can get one of these cards, and you get like fifty credits. And you can do first person, second person, third person, fourth person, you know. I'm not sure with this one. So I'll have to research it and talk about it in another episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time we go, we'll be better about um, preparing for public transportation. But yeah. we walked and, and it was great. And so when we got into the park, we there was this nice grassy area with all those beautiful green chairs around them that you've mentioned on previous episodes. And yeah. yes, they are as relaxing and amazing as you say they are. Yes, they're good. Oh, they're great. And so anyway, the kids were playing on the grass for about 20 minutes. And then eventually a man who appeared to be a guard came up and said something to us in French. And we didn't understand what he said, but we basically understood that the kids weren't supposed to be on the grass. Yeah. And so we got them up. So lesson learned. They can't just play anywhere they want to in the park. There are certain designated areas. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a nice playground for kids. In the Luxembourg Gardens, but I think it's like a couple euros to go in. But but then the problem is if you let them go in there, they'll never want to come out. <laughs> well, <laughs> and we didn't end up there because I think they were so tired out from walking all that way. Then yes. we just went to the pond and we went to the little boat um, pond where they can rent boats and push them around with sticks. And, yeah. And that was awesome. The kids loved that. So we did that for a while and then they were done for that day. Yeah. Cool. Okay, there's some, place. there's something in that your dinner plans for that day. Maison Plisson, okay, cold chili. They marketed it as a salad. <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of weird. My husband was the one who bought dinner that night, and he brought it back and said, "Look at this amazing salad! Isn't this wonderful?" And I read the label, and I said, "This is chili," <laughs> and they're they're serving it cold. I mean, it was definitely meant to be eaten cold. So that was kind of weird for us being yeah. from the U.S. Uh, yeah, yeah. French people My don't understand Mexican at all. <laughs> Just at Italians all. Italians don't either. Okay. <laughs> that makes me feel better. <laughs> all right. Your third day. So our third day. That was our busiest day. And we really ran the kids ragged that day. I'll, I'll move through this one quickly. We started with um, an Eiffel Tower photo shoot. And we actually chose our photographer because of your Facebook group. And we got a recommendation for this photographer named Ian, and his partner was Gloria. And Gloria Via was actually featured on the Honeymooners in Paris podcast that right. you did recently. Right. And I believe that couple had a great experience with her, and we did too. She was absolutely phenomenal and um, really good with the kids. And so I would definitely recommend her for families. Wonderful. Good to know. Yeah. 
And, and, and are, I want people um, to know that this is not an affiliate recommendation. I, I'm not making a penny out of this. Just people like her. <laughs> so, you know, go to her because people, people like her. Yeah. And I'm not being paid anything either. So good. <laughs> um, she's just that great. Yeah. So um, what was interesting, so I mentioned the pickpockets earlier, we encountered them during our photo shoot. And it was interesting because we were in a park just um, right outside of the Eiffel Tower. And there were park authorities coming through and telling her in French, there are pickpockets in the area. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, a few minutes later, some came over. I'm not going to get into that again, but um, that's where we encountered them was by the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, And then... We went on the Eiffel Tower, and the kids just loved that. So that is a not-miss activity with kids also. Yeah. It's un- unforgettable because, you know, it's so grand. And when you're a little kid, it's even grander. You know, yeah, it's perfect. And for this year, I believe it's the 130th anniversary. Mm-hmm. So they had some cool um, displays on the first floor talking about how it was developed and these cool little areas where you could get your photo taken. So it's especially great to go this year. Oh, that's good because almost nobody stops on the first floor. So that's great to know. Well, we did and we loved it. Yeah. Yeah. So how you do this is you, the elevator takes you up to the second floor directly and then when you come down you can either walk down to the first with your feet or you the elevator will stop on the first floor on the way down yes and i believe that we stopped on the elevator on the first floor going down yeah very good and then from there um at this point i was craving a really good meal because we'd been eating mostly at the apartment or kind of touristy stuff because it's where we happen to be and So I'd done some research on um, nice restaurants near our apartment, and there was one called Qui Plume La Lune, which um, had one Michelin star, and it was in the 11th arrondissement, just about two blocks from where we were staying. Uh Uh-huh. Qui Plume Um, La Lune, that's a cute name. (laughs) What does it mean? To pluck the moon. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) So um, it was really cute. We felt like we were in a wine cave. It just had a really great ambiance, and I was definitely nervous going in, um, having two young kids. And so I learned to say at the beginning, um, I said, I think I said, j'ai deux enfants d'accord, which I think means. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. I have two children, okay? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And they said, yeah, we, we have a children's menu even. I thought, okay, we're good, because they have a children's menu, and, um, it was just a really great experience. The waiters were really great with the kids. The kids were well behaved. Um, I, I tend to be allowed tend to be loud by American standards, and so um, French people are much more quiet in general than Americans when they're eating. So we had to be really mindful of that, mm-hmm. and we were whispering the whole time. But the kids were great, and they were quiet, and we weren't disruptive. And it was a wonderful experience. That's so great. Don't That's, let, yeah, yeah. So don't let kids hold you back from having a nice meal. I think that. Our, our experiences at the restaurants were definitely accommodating. That's wonderful. Yeah. We also went to the Rodin Museum that day, and the kids really liked that. I think that's a good one for kids because it's mostly outdoors. Yeah. Well, the, well there's a lot of indoors as well, but there's some of both. Yeah. We skipped the indoors, but we okay. um, we enjoyed the outdoors and thought that was good for young kids. Yeah. And then, and then based on your recommendations and everybody else's, we went to L'Entrecote. Did I say that right? Yeah, l'entrecote, yes. And we enjoyed that. We thought it was really good. I guess the one that we went to is not related to the one in Toulouse. It's mm-hmm. a different family or something. But, yeah, they're all related. It's cousins. They had some fights and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, whatever. The, yeah, the original like, one is from Toulouse. And then it spread. And then the family fought over the money, obviously. And yeah. But, but yeah, it was still good. We enjoyed yeah. it. And um, because we didn't take any breaks that day, our son slept through the entire dinner. But it was all good. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty much um, our experience with Paris. We did have some time on the way back after we did the rest of our traveling. And I would also say something not to miss is going to see the Eiffel Tower sparkling at night. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, so... So we did that on our last night, and that is something that the kids keep talking about when we ask them what they remember about the trip. That's the one thing that they mentioned. So Mm -hmm. um, I think that was a good way to end the trip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Now, I want to mention, oh, sorry, um, but let me mention that you also have notes about your TGV from um, to Bordeaux and what you did in Bordeaux and what you did in the Gers. We're not going to take the time to talk about all of that here today, but it, it'll be in your guest notes. So if people go to the show notes for this episode, there's going to be a blue button that says guest notes. Click on that and you'll see everything she had to say about these other places, which is also interesting. Yeah, they were great, and I would recommend both. Yeah, with little kids, I think it's good to go outside of Paris a little bit or at least spend some time in parks and, you know, in, in places where they, they can run around. Like the Rodin is perfect because it's this enclosed area where there's no vehicles. I mean, you can let them loose and they can go hide behind bushes or whatever it is that they're going to do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> cool. One other thing about Paris is, and I kind of got to this earlier, we didn't use public transportation at all. Um, we did Ubers everywhere. And the reason that we did that is because most Uber rides were somewhere between 10 and 16 euros, which is not that much more expensive than it would have been to take a bus or to take the Metro. So we, we just thought it was more convenient for our family. And that's what we ended up doing. And we knew from your podcast that we would be okay to not have car seats in the taxis. And so Right. Um, that worked out really well for us. Yeah, I think, I mean, trying to figure out when you only have three days in a city, trying to figure out the transportation system might not be a very good use of your time. You know, if you're going to be spending more time there, then sure, you know, and especially with the apps now. And I don't know if Atlanta has a metro, does it? Yes, but it Many people don't use it, and it's pretty limited. Ah. So if, you, if you're in a city where you already use the metro or the buses or whatever, then it's not going to be that different. But if you don't, if you're not familiar with that kind of system, then it'll be, a, you know, a few rides before you're comfortable. So, and with four people, you know, yeah, it's, it's cost effective to do Uber. Or taxi. Yeah, it worked well for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some things that I wish I had known or done differently. Well, first of all, we learned very quickly how to say we were sorry in French, which is je suis désolé. Yes. <laughs> so that's an important phrase to know with kids because in case they get out of control, you can at least apologize and let people know that they're not normally like that. But um, <laughs> that's a good one to know. Yes. And we used it a lot. <laughs> um <laughs> And get back to your point of only being there for three days, you've said in the past, you need at least five days for Paris. And I completely agree. Yeah. Um, it wasn't enough time for us, but I think we still got a lot out of it. Yeah, you certainly did. And it's true that the fact that you had to miss Atelier des Lumières is unfortunate because that's one that I think kids would enjoy because it's so visual. It's music and sound and, and uh, sound and lights and stuff. So it would have been great. But yeah, planning it the first day was not, uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, lesson learned. Yep. Um, in terms of um, potty training, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but my son was in the middle of potty training when we right. went on this trip, um, which we hadn't necessarily anticipated, but we knew that that was a possibility. And we found the bathroom situation to be really wonderful in Paris. Um, in fact, he didn't have any accidents that first week because he just told us, I need to go potty and we would find a toilet. So mm -hmm. um, that was not the same in our second week, but in Paris, that was okay. So anybody worried about that, just put them in a pull up and let have them tell you when they need to go and it'll all work out. Yeah. Paris has enough bars and cafes and stuff that you can always find something. Yeah. It was, it was not a problem at all. Yeah. Um, I meant, I mentioned earlier, just eat your lunches out and eat dinner back at where you're staying. Um, on top of that, we always, for our entire trip, we made sure that we either had really big rooms or we had um, apartments with at least two bedrooms. And I think that's a must with traveling with small children if you can afford it. Just be, And it doesn't have to be expensive either. You can find good deals. But I think people need their space and kids need their yeah. space. And if you're on top of each other for the entire trip, you're not going to enjoy it. Right. And also, and the kids need a lot more sleep than the grown ups. And so if you're all in one room, it's going to be hard to have them sleep while you're still up doing things. Yeah. We 
I had wanted to shop a lot more. I loved your podcast on the cooking stores because I love buying cooking gadgets. <laughs> and um, I was really hoping to make it to some of those stores. But with kids, you just don't not get enough the time. time to shop. Yeah, nope. not so, enough time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I didn't get my cooking gear. I didn't get to buy any scarves while I was in Paris, which Aww. I wanted to do. Yeah. You're going to have to come back. Any of the, I, yeah. I didn't want to buy any of the Eiffel Tower ones at the airport. So... Um, yeah, you know, I and, they have these Eiffel Tower, Tower scarves everywhere, and they, I don't like them either. I don't want one with the Eiffel yeah. Tower. I want some other pattern. No. <laughs> nope, I agree. So I wasn't willing to cave and buy one of those, so I, I'll just come back, like you said, and buy one Exactly. Time. You're going to have to come back. And then your kids will be a little older, and I'm sure they won't remember this trip. I mean, you took some wonderful photos, and I'll use them to illustrate this episode. But, uh, yeah, they won't remember it, but it'll be good when you can tell them, you know, look, you were here before, and, you know, you show them the photo from before, and they they like that. Yeah, and and definitely our son won't remember it, but I think maybe our daughter will. And maybe. And ever since we've been back, they've been crying like my son was crying this weekend and I said why are you crying he said I want to go back to France I'm going to see the Eiffel Tower again (laughs) so um we we just had an incredible trip and and a lot of people thought we were crazy for taking kids this young we thought we were crazy too but um (laughs) but it worked out it worked out it was a wonderful trip and I would if anybody's thinking about it don't hesitate just do it it will be worth it it will be hard and you're gonna have to do a lot of planning but France is a wonderful country for traveling with children. People were incredibly friendly, and it was very accommodating. So we we highly recommend it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming to talk about it on the podcast because it's going to be encouraging to people who are considering uh, taking a trip to France with preschoolers because that that's a special case. I mean, we've talked about f- traveling to France with kids and with teens, but preschoolers, you know, yeah. That's that's a that's a challenge. <laughs> it definitely is, but it's worth it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. You've been wonderful. Uh, merci, Annie. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you, J. M. Amber Brown and John Harrison for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. Patrons enjoy several rewards that you'll find listed at patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no spaces or dashes. I share exclusive content with my patrons, including help with your French comprehension. Get on with it, folks. (laughs) Stories about France, photos and membership into a secret Facebook group. And of course, patrons can message me directly through Patreon and these messages always have top priority. Visit patreon.com forward slash join us to see the different reward tiers and thank you so much for giving back. My thanks also to Annette Gasperi, Maris Russo, and Ernesto Di Jesus for your one-time donation, which they did by clicking on the green button that says tip your guide on any page on joinusinfrance.com. Ernesto also wrote a lovely note that says... Thank you, Annie, for the podcast. I went to Paris for the first time at the end of October for a week with my brother. (laughs) Maybe your brother didn't have a cold. (laughs) I'm glad that I found podcasts a few months prior. They were a big help. I definitely plan to return in 2020 and using the audio tours that you have. I'd like to talk uh, about suggestions for first-time travelers and things that I learned and observed during my first visit, if possible. Merci, Ernesto. Thank you for giving back, all of you. And yes, Ernesto, I'm always looking for enthusiastic visitors to do trip reports with me, whether they make a donation or not, and I've emailed you with the details. Your patronage and donations is how I pay my bills. I also produce GPS-aware Paris tours on an app called Voice Map where I take you to where the stories are. Go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash audio tours for details, and there will be a link in the show notes for that. Another service I provide is itinerary review. People go to the Facebook group, the Join Us in France closed closed group on Facebook, and they ask questions about, you know, I want to know about the best of this or the best of that, whatever. And they get, of course, 50 different responses Most of them contradicting each other. 
hey, that's real helpful, isn't it? But we all love social media regardless, so people are going to keep doing that. But if you'd like, if you'd like me to review your itinerary instead, so you're sure to do the right thing, email me, annie at joinusinfrance.com and write itinerary review in the subject line. It'll cost you 50 bucks, but it'll save you a lot of time. And if you'd like to support the show without spending a penny you wouldn't have otherwise, before you go shopping on Amazon, go to the bottom of any page on joinusinfrance.com and click on the ads. There's an Amazon ad and there's a booking ad. Because you get to those sites through join us, I get a small commission and it does not cost you a penny more. And it, this has been enough so far to pay for the cost of producing the show, which, you know, it's, it's not super expensive, but it's not zero. So thank you so much for doing that. For my personal update this week, well, I'm sick. So I mostly drank warm tea and stuck around the house. Exciting, I know. But it's a new year, so I looked at the 10, uh, 10, top 10 episodes for 2019. Are you ready for the reveal? Number 10 was Overview of Paris Museums, episode 187. This is an episode with Elise where we go down the list of most museums in Paris, not all of them, but most of them, and tell you what you can expect to see there. And I'm really happy that listeners are taking the time to get educated about that because when you choose the right place for you, you have a good time in Paris. When you go blindly because somebody told you to, you don't. That's how it works anywhere in the world. Number nine, quick and easy guide to public transportation in France. That's episode 223. And this is no surprise because visitors need to understand how to get around in a country that they are not familiar with. This is a solo episode where I give a broad overview of public transportation in France. When you listen to that, you're prepared to choose the best mode of transportation for the for your situation again it's about you figuring out what's best for you because a lot of times in life you ask a question and the answer is it depends right and it's the same with when it comes to travel to France. Number eight is Saint Germain des Prés neighborhood uh, episode one ninety six. It's an episode with Elise again, where she explains the historical background of the area. And I'll be releasing a voice map tour of this wonderful neighborhood in 2020, where I take you to all the best places and tell you about them with the app. Number seven, Four Days in Paris, episode 218. This one is a trip report that appeals to people who don't have a lot of time to look for inspiration on how to make the most of that time. And that's a really important thing for people to think about. I don't have a lot of time. I got to be selective. And I'll add to that, that uh, since producing this trip report, I've produced Paris tours that are GPS aware tours. And that's what they do. They help you go to the best quickly. Number six, the vibe of Paris neighborhoods. That's episode 199. This is a real problem for people. They wonder where should they stay? They want safe. They want convenient. They want not too expensive. And they want local vibe. And I explain how to find that in that solo episode. And I'm also happy to give specific hotel recommendations that you'll find under the resource tab at joinusinfrance.com. Number five, do's and don'ts at restaurants in France, episode 209. This is a solo show again where I explain how things run in France. Because if you show up in Paris thinking you're going to the Cheesecake Factory, you'll be sorely disappointed. Just warning you. Number four, Cafe Culture in France. That's episode 228. That's another episode with Elise where we take a deep dive into, well, cafe culture in France and also how to order your drinks in France because they, they, yeah, it's not like Starbucks. It's a bit different. Number three, what to pack to look stylish in Paris, episode 195. People worry a lot about what to wear in Paris, what shoes, what coat, what this, what that. This is amusing to me because that's really the last thing on my mind. 
Just ask my sister. She has to yell at me before I dress up a bit. But this is a trip report that I did with a man who really cares about uh, how he dresses. And he does a fantastic job explaining it. So episode 195. Number two, 12 tips for visiting Paris you'll actually use. It's a trip report with uh, my friend from the uh, Eric Chow from the Philippines. Well, I say my friend. I've never met him. He's my friend on the podcast. Wonderful guy. He gives a lot of good um, tips. And also, it's a good title. So that's lesson learned for me. And number one is 12 things to do in Paris for first-time visitors, episode 179. That's an episode with Elise where we make it simple for you. We give you 12 things, right? Um, I, I, well, do we give you 12? I don't remember. If we, give, we give you a specific list of things. And then if you have the time, you can do them all. If you don't have the time, do just a few. But we make it really, really simple for you. So what does this tell me in terms of appeal of various episodes going forward? Well, first of all, this podcast is popular despite my lack of marketing skills. All-time downloads is 1,372,995 as I write this. And these are the stats from Libsyn. That's the company that hosts the podcast. So when you click play, your phone is talking to a server at Libsyn. And they are not known for inflating their numbers, quite the opposite as a matter of fact. So yes, yes, people love the show. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Last May and June, I got carried away recording too many trip reports, sometimes one a day, and I still haven't released all of them. But I need to be a little more strategic about this, looking at this list of top 10, right? I should change the lineup of shows a little bit. So I should do more episodes with Elise. I've been doing one a month, generally speaking, but I need to do more than that. So in uh, 2020, there's going to be five months with five Sundays. And that matters because I released the show on a Sunday. Uh, That'll be March, May, August, and November, for those who are wondering. I will produce two episodes with Elise for those months. Well, if she has the time to do this, obviously, I haven't talked to her about it, but she likes to do the show, so I think she'll say yes. There will also be one solo show each month with me where I tackle something that I think you need to understand about how things work in France. And obviously, this is where I get to bring in my French born and raised kind of experience and also the fact that I lived in the U.S. for 18 years and so... I can easily compare the two countries. It comes natural to me. Uh, people who've only lived in the U.S. wouldn't see this, and people who've only lived in France don't see it. They don't know what to warn you about, because to them, the way it's done in France is the way it's done, you know? So in that case, I'll prepare something where I go into depth of what it's like and why. And I'll also continue to do episode shorts now and then. Those are not really scheduled. They go in between episodes, uh, where I need to respond to a particular timely topic That comes up on the Facebook group a lot, and I can do that uh, around five minutes. So that will leave room for two trip reports per month, and I will resume recording those soon. Uh, Email me, Annie, at joinusinfrance.com if you have enthusiasm and (laughs) um, the willingness to share your experience with the listenership. I will also produce at least two Patreon rewards each month. Uh, the last one I did with my husband, David, has gotten a lot of um, very positive response. It was a lunch break French where, where we help you uh, improve your French pronunciation. And I also have a goal to release two new voice map tours for Paris this year. So it's going to be a busy year and I am excited because this is what I love to do. If you want to recommend the podcast to someone who already listens to podcasts, well, tell them that they can find the Join Us in France travel podcast anywhere they get their podcasts. And if they listen to music but not podcasts on their phones, tell them they can listen to Join Us in France on Spotify or Pandora. And if they don't normally listen to anything on their phones, send them to joinusinfrance.com. And thank you so much for spreading the word. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Have a great week of trip planning, a wonderful time in France if that's where you are, and I'll talk to you next week. Au revoir. 
The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2019 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>